look into Facebook. Today, I believe, has been ordained by the Holy Ghost before the foundation of the world. And we've already had our session in the back. We're going to just let y'all in on some of that. Um, I, I want to start off by saying this. I believe this is needed in our community. Yeah. I, think, I think there comes a time when we do church well and then we struggle with life. And, and if you have a community such as this, a local church community, you shouldn't have to go to a special seminar or whatever to get these gems. These should be a part of your gathering, your main gatherings. So it may not look like church as you are used to church looking. But trust me, call it what you want to call it, it is the Lord's doing. And so let, let's get started. Um, I want London to read this bio and we'll introduce this precious lady here who's going to be so instrumental in taking us further in our family series. Um, go ahead. Many people know. If you can turn her mic up just like mine. Go ahead. Many people know Miranda Chanel as a speaker, but by profession, she is actually a listener, an alum of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Aurora University. She holds a bachelor's degree in communications and a master's degree in social work. She obtained her license in 2008 and has provided intensive therapeutic services in detention centers, DCFS residential setting, and group homes, and has done individual group and family therapies. She currently serves as the director of a state-funded 24-hour crisis line for children and adults experiencing behavioral health and mental health crises and she facilitates a weekly trauma group that focuses on understanding and healing from abuse. Miranda Chanel's focus is to decrease the stigma of mental illness through the powerful tool of transparency and to bridge the gap, especially in black communities between spiritual health and mental health. Amen, can we give it up for Sister Mrs. Miranda Chanel. Come on, y'all can clap better than that. And so I, we, I had the privilege of being introduced to her through Pastor Keisha Sanders, um, who she did one of her events. And we had a phone call, and I tell you this, the anointing of the Lord was on that call. Um, she helped our family in a, in a time where... Um, Okay, see, that wasn't, that wasn't even supposed to do all that. Um, she didn't even realize how she helped our family. And so we've been talking through um, in this series about dismantling. Um, come on, bring the tissue, man. You're gonna sit. <laughs> you might want to leave it here because I think we're going to need this. Put it over there on the table. I'll get y'all's ready to. <laughs> We've been talking about confronting and dismantling um, dysfunction. Help me, London, because I'm all in chaos and family and conflict. And we want to move further with that. And so um, if, if you want to just start off, just kind of share about yourself a little bit. I'll be read your bio, but share a little bit. And then we'll jump off of one of these questions and we'll ride from there. How about that? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm humbled and appreciative. And I never ever take for granted the opportunity to speak to people. And so I appreciate you for trusting not only the education that I have, but the anointing that I have Amen. to speak to your people who God has entrusted Amen. you to lead. Amen. So good morning. I am Miranda Chanel. Um, most people know me as a speaker, a mentor, um, a minister. I, I try to keep that part contained, but she don't always know how to act. So I'm going to try, try to keep her contained today as well. But by profession, I am a social worker. I do the hard stuff that people don't like to do. I say stuff out loud that people think in their head. Um, I ask questions that are going to make you uncomfortable on purpose. Ask me why. I'm so glad you asked. Because 
it is not until we're uncomfortable that we change. You don't change your clothes until they get uncomfortable and they don't fit right. Mm. You don't change relationships until it gets uncomfortable. You don't move from the apartment to the house until you realize you got too much stuff to fit in this space. You don't change until you get uncomfortable. Mm. And so I am your uncomfortability coach on this morning. Mm. We don't like to go to therapy. We don't want to put our business out in the street. So take all of that off. I never tell people, oh, I'm licensed to do this and I carry this degree and I hold this and I hold that because people think that you look at them some sort of way. So I'm not looking at y'all like none of that. Why? Because I come with my own stuff. I come with my own daddy issues and my own mama trauma. I come with my own divorce, my own single parent hoodness, mm. the worst hood to ever be in, the single parent hood, I don't like it. Mm. It's the west side, south side, and all other sides put together and then some. It's tough stuff. And yet every day we equip ourselves, we go into it and we battle it out. Mm. Most of us all by ourselves coming to church Sunday after Sunday, jumping in the same prayer lines week after week, waiting for the next prophecy for me to tell you that the answer is already on the inside of you. You just don't want to do the work to pull it out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I might make you uncomfortable. Mm. If so, I did what Amen. you needed me to do. <laughs> and so I want to I wanna start off before we jump into this, this, this deep water. Let's just talk about therapy itself, because I know in our community um, coming up, I never really heard of a lot of therapy. Um, and the extreme was, we don't need therapists, we got the Holy Ghost. Um, if you get therapy, something's wrong with you, you're crazy, you're looked at, there's stigma on you. And then somewhere we went from that to the other extreme of everybody has to have therapy. It became, like you said, a hashtag. It's like, you know, it's the end thing. How do we balance that out? You know, how do we get from, we don't need it to, if I stub my toe, I need it now. Correct. Uh, talk about that. So that's us, right? Mm. That's our stuff of we don't go to therapy. How many of y'all grew up in what happens in this house stays in this house? Me, right? Except that it doesn't. Mm. Except that what happens in this house shows up in every other house that you walk into. Mm. The trauma that you don't deal with becomes the drama that you show up with every time you go somewhere. Because what happens in this house goes with me. Mm. I may not get to tell you why I came the way I came because it happened in that house, but I bring it with me. And now we have gotten to a point to where therapy is cute. Mm. I got a Jesus and therapy shirt. Because I believe we need both. Mm. You know, I got a mess in a bottle, be right back, going to therapy, because it's cute. Mm. But in reality, therapy isn't cute. It's ugly. Mm. It's, it's I ain't got no brows type ugly. It's he ain't got no fresh lining type ugly. Mm. It's all the scars that my mama, daddy, grandmama, uncle who touched me, and we still not talking about how he touched all the girls in the family type ugly. Therapy is mm. not cute. Mm but it is necessary. It's necessary. And it's not temporary. Therapy is not a temporary fix. It's like a vitamin. Mm. You take it on a regular to ensure that you get healthy and stay healthy. Mm. You build up a reservoir so that when stuff happens, you got enough on the inside of you not to break in the midst of it. And that doesn't happen fast. Mm. We think I'm gonna go find somebody and she gonna give me the answers. I'm not. Mm. Tell that. Tell that. I'm probably not the one who at the end of the service, you'd be like, you taking new clients? You don't want me. I promise you don't. Cause I'm gonna push every button that you don't want to be pushed. You not gonna like me. You're going to expect to come in and say, well, this is what my mother did. So tell me what to do. And I'm gonna say nothing. Mm because it's not my job as your therapist to give you the answers. Please open that up for us. It is my job to help you uncover the core of your issues and equip you to not pour out your stuff on everybody else. You wonder why your kid got an attitude? It's yours. 
and your mamas and your grandmamas too. Mm. The same way we pass down diabetes, we pass down depression. We pass down anxiety, but we don't want to put a label on that. Mm. Because there's something wrong with you if you go to therapy. No, there's something right with you for dealing with your stuff. Mm. All of it. Even the stuff that ain't your fault. It is not your fault that you endured what you endured, but it is your responsibility yeah, to heal yeah. from it. It is your responsibility to heal from it. To heal from it. Mm. Because there's a common cliche that hurt people hurt people. But the truth in that is also that healed people heal people. Mm. The reason that I am good at what I do is not because I got a bunch of degrees. Thermometers got degrees and they don't do nothing. The reason that I am good at what I do is because I know what it was like to have nothing. I know what it was like to be broken and show up and act like I had it together. I know what it was like to be in a house with married parents and still feel disconnected from my daddy. I know what it was like to have a mama who felt like she could ask me all sorts of questions even though I was good and grown and it was disrespectful for me to have boundaries. Mm. We talk about breaking generational curses. No, 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 no. We need to change the perspective of respect. Mm. I am not disrespectful because my marriage is my marriage. Some of the reason that your marriages fall apart is because you have more than three folds in your cord and God ain't not a man one of them. Yeah. Everything is not everybody's business. Come on. Wow. Now talk about that. Talk about the, go ahead, the so, boundaries. Okay. Is that what you're going to say? Before we get to the okay. boundaries, we were talking about, I'm you so wanted sorry. to mention that whole story <laughs> about the whole root, root piece. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So... I am a member of a phenomenal church. Shout out to Pastor Jared and Jeannie Stevens at Soul City. Yeah. However, before I was a member there, I was a visitor here. Mm. And I sat right in that second row every week because I still couldn't figure out that me getting here early meant they was gonna bring me to the front every time. <laughs> Um, however, in my visiting, you guys were in a series, mm. a family series at that time. Mm. And your phenomenal pastor was teaching about uprooting things. And he told a story about how there's a tree outside of your house and people see the tree. And they see your manicured grass. But if by chance there's something dead in that tree and it has to be uprooted, you don't just tear up the tree here it potentially has roots that go into this neighbor's yard and that neighbor's yard and the people all the way down there. So when you start uprooting that thing that you know has damage, it shakes up everything that's next to it. The same thing happens in therapy. When we start uprooting our stuff, that's in our hearts and in our minds and in our families, you don't just uproot it for you and your social media profile. You uproot your mama stuff and your auntie stuff and your granddaddy stuff and everybody else's stuff that's connected to you. You uproot your husband's family stuff because now you connected to their stuff. And so it's not as simple as I'm just going to tear this thing up and make it look easy because you have the ability to tear up everything around you if you don't do it with grace. Now, how, now how do you balance that? Because if, if I need healing and I know I got a problem with my mother, my father, whoever it is, and I want to come and sit and talk with a therapist and tell my truth and, tell, and, and, and go through the process, but my family didn't ask for that. They didn't ask to have their yard uprooted or their fence torn down because you're trying to get free, but you have now brought me into this. How do I balance that out? With Because I'm trying to get help and healing, but now I've caused bigger issues because mama didn't want me talking about that or my brother didn't want me bringing that out. And, and how do I balance my truth, if, if, if I can put it like that? Okay, so a couple answers. Number one, if you got issues with everybody, you are the common denominator. 
If it's your mama, your daddy, your boyfriend, the teacher, your baby daddy, your cousin, the pastor, the girl that sit three rows behind you in church, if you can't get along with anybody in any setting, it's you, sis. Mm. It's, it's, it's you, king. You can still be a king and be broken. You can, still, you can still be a queen and have work to do. So the key in, in going through it and knowing that you're going to uproot stuff is working on your grass first. Mm. Pay mm. attention to your yard. Mm. If the weeds are right here, yes, me tearing them up may tear up some stuff over there, but let me make sure that I can contain the stuff in front of me. Mm. Because fixing me should not break you. Mm. Now, now, should I, the, the example I taught and you just mentioned about the neighbors, because when we did that, it affected our neighbor's yards. But I had to go and knock on the door and say, hey, here's what's going to happen. Somebody's coming to dig up, but they're going to be up under your fence too. Should we, in approaching our healing, and it's about a particular person in your family? Should I go to them first and say, hey, I'm gonna be dealing with this, this may happen or come out, or how do you deal with that? It depends on who it is and what it is. Okay. If you have been sexually abused, no, don't go back to that joker and say, hey, I'm gonna go tell these people that you touched me when I was eight. Mm -hmm. Cause you're gonna re-traumatize yourself. Mm. Now, if it's, hey, I've started going to therapy and some things have come up with my mother mm. that maybe I didn't even realize were, were under the roots. Mm -hmm. We don't always know what the roots are connected to. That's part of the problem. That's right. And so as you begin to see, hey, now this is, oh, this is going back to my mama. Mm. Oh, so that's why I do blah, blah, blah. Now, perhaps I can have a conversation with my mama, mm. but my mama may not be ready for that conversation. Because the truth is, as parents, we do the best we can, mm. even when the best we can ain't good enough. Mm. We work from the capacity of which we have. Mm. And so if I don't have anything else, then I'm giving to you from the nothingness that I hold. Mm. And so for you, because this is how we think, you didn't got so high and mighty that you want to go get healed, and now you want to tell me all the things that I did wrong. Part of it is in our approach. Yeah, yeah. The same grace that we want people to have for us, we have to have for them even in our healing. Mm. Even in our healing. Even in our healing. We want somebody to be compassionate with us because you don't know what I've been through. Mm. We, my, that lyrics to my worship is for real carries over to mental health. Yeah. You don't know my story. Mm. But at the same token, you probably don't know your mama's whole story either. Mm. Or your daddy's, or your uncle's, or your baby daddy, or whoever else it is. It's very easy for us to identify this person did this to me, but who did it to them? Mm. Mm. What is it that they were lacking? that resulted in them having insufficient funds and yet they still trying to deposit into you. Mm. Jeez, jeez, say that again, say that again. Don't say it slow what this time, go ahead. What is it that caused them to have insufficient funds but they are still trying to deposit into you? So it's safe to say that when it comes to this function and historic creation, grace is needed for all. It's neat. Listen, sprinkle, y'all know that hot sauce commercial <laughs> where that lady was like, I put that on everything. Y'all better <laughs> apply grace the same right. way. Put it on everything. Right, right. That's good. Because it doesn't matter how much you give out, you can stand to give a little bit more. That's good. That's good. It's easy for us to say, I wish somebody would just listen. I, I wish somebody could just see me. I wish they, they, they hear me, but they not listening. Mm. Mm. The same things that you want and need, as do the people connected to you. Mm. Grace. And no matter what it is that they have done to you, minimally, 
you can give them the gift of grace, even if you're not ready to give them the gift of forgiveness. Mm. Jeez. So you cannot be ready to give the gift of forgiveness. Yes. You can be in the midst of forgiveness and feel like you want to take that stuff back. (laughs) (laughs) Because we, especially in the church, wrap up forgiveness with a scripture. And we guilt people into forgiveness and tell them, if you don't forgive, God ain't going to forgive you and you're going to go to hell. So we lie through forgiveness. Oh, I forgave. No, you don't. Because every time you smell somebody that wear that cologne, you get a headache. Mm. You ain't forgave. Mm. Every time they come in a room, you feel like you need to throw up. You Mm. have not forgiven. Jeez. You see it come on a TV show and you got to turn it off because it links you back to that experience. You have not forgiven. Mm. Now, now go ahead. I, I, I don't know. Go, go ahead. Yeah, we talked about this in the back as far as forgiveness is concerned. Mm-hmm. We, last, last week, we, had, we get, didn't get through our normal service, mm-hmm. and we had a line for forgiveness. And so we said, hey, call out the person that has forgiven, that, that you need to forgive. And people did that. People received that. But that was the start of forgiveness. In the clinical terms, what is the process? What can people do? After you've done the spiritual part, after you've made the decision, what can you do in the process to obtain that forgiveness? Okay. Well, first, I hope y'all called out y'all own names while y'all was up here calling out other folks. If not, y'all might want to do that line again. Another line. (laughs) (laughs) Because we have a hard time forgiving other people because we first cannot forgive ourselves. Mm. Jeez. You can't release them because you can't get it off your own conscience. My God. So start with you. Mm. Then pick it apart in pieces. That's good. The damage that was done didn't come wrapped up in a package. Here, I'm going to give you all this trauma. Have it. No. Mm. So when you're saying, I'm going to forgive Bobo, great. That's a step. Mm. Just one. Now, what all do you have to forgive Bobo for? And work it piece by piece. Because when I can forgive you for this piece, Mm. then I can take another step to see you in a different perspective. But if all I can see is the damage that you've caused, I want to stay over here because staying over here is safer for me. Yes. I'm safe if I just see you as somebody who causes trauma. Mm. I stay in my box because I know what's in my box. I only let you so far because vulnerability is a scary space to be in. And I keep other people at that same level because I ain't going to never let nobody else get close enough to do what Bobo did. Jeez. So if I work it piece by piece, then my perspective of it changes and I can let something else that's healing into this space. Mm. It's not a one-stop shop. That's good. I I, I think it's important that we hear that because we teach that forgiveness and and to release someone is a decision. Then you go to the process of forgiving or releasing. But to know that process includes taking it one piece at a time like you said in the back, today I'm going to deal with, right now I'm dealing with how you lied to me. I ain't dealing with the other parts of it. Mm-hmm. Just the whole part that you lied to me. And I'm forgiving you and releasing you for that. I think we need these practical tools. Um, a, lot, a lot we teach and, and, and talk through in our church. And so I hope you guys are getting um, the freshness of it. Um, we have no excuses to not be walking in freedom because we're getting all the tools. We have no excuse to still have a flat tire when we have a jack and a spare in the trunk. 
But if you don't have anybody to teach you how to use the jack and the spare, you Come just on. got some tools sitting in there waiting down the back of your Come car. On. Come on. My daddy taught me a lot of things. It's a jack and a spare in the back of mm -hmm. that baby truck. It parked right there. Mm -hmm. If by chance I hit a flat, I'm calling my daddy because I don't know what to do with neither one of them. <laughs> and what so happens? you need more than tools. You need the instructions need the on how, how to use the, the tools or you just got a bunch of tools. And what happens if you don't know how? Because we give the how-to, but if you don't know how or you do know how and you still call daddy and he don't know how either. Okay, so. Because we're expecting, we're expecting that they should know a thing, but they don't. And like you said, they're doing the best that they can. And some of us are bitter now because when I called you, you didn't. Correct. But you didn't know how either. Correct. And so a part of that goes back to us being honest about what is in our capacity to do. Mm. I don't have to be good at all things. If we could learn to stay in our own lane, Let's traffic would move smoother. Let's go there. Let's go there. So as a mother... I'm a great mom. Thank you, self. You're welcome. <laughs> sometimes you got to tell yourself. You got to encourage you yourself. Encourage Come listen, on. Listen, listen. Uh, sometimes you have to tell yourself because life will make you think that you're not good at the stuff you know you're good at. Come on. And ain't nobody else going to come along and remind you, especially in the moments where it's dark. You dark in that joker by yourself. Mm. So you got to tell yourself until you believe it. You better be a Mary Jane that thing out and get you a pack of post-its and write it on there and read it till it becomes the truth mm. if you have to. But as great of a mom as I am, I can't teach my two boys how to be men. Mm. Mm. Real, 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 real clear. I could not teach them how to stand up to use the restroom. I don't do that. doesn't make me any less of a good mom. It just means I don't have the proper equipment to teach them this. And I was not going to let them be 12 years old still sitting. Mm. <laughs> Therefore, because <laughs> cause, cause that's what we do. I can't give it to you so you just won't have it. Wrong. Jeez. Find you a tribe who can teach what you cannot teach. I am a therapist by profession. However, I am a mother. My kids are not going to tell me everything because I'm their mama. Mm. It don't make them bad kids. It don't make me a bad mama. It's a part of the natural development of life. Mm. You didn't tell your parents everything. I know you didn't. If you say you did, you're telling a story in the house of the Lord. <laughs> However, what we have to do now, what I did was I told my children, hey, this is uncle such and such, this is auntie such and such. They are your safe people. If you can't tell me, if it's about me, you can tell them anything. Mm. Because I trust them with your life, they don't have to tell me. You better find somebody who you can trust. Because if they can't come to me, they have to have somebody that they can go to that's safe. Sometimes we're the problem. Mm. And, you, and you help your children you identify who those people are. I chose them, to them on them purpose. As opposed to them finding them themselves. Yes, okay. here's why. Because you have to choose people who, number one, you can say if they said it to them, and I never hear it again, I know that they're going to give them advice that would save their life. Mm. Kids don't have the capacity to choose that for themselves. Mm. That's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Go ahead. But I trust you enough to where even if I never hear it, I know my kid is safe. Mm. Wow. Hey, you can't go to me, call Uncle Eli. He ain't gonna steal you wrong. He gonna check you if you wrong. And I don't have to know. And you're not gonna get offended and, and get into it with Uncle Eli because- No, because I chose him. There you go. Good. We choose godparents because they gonna buy uh, Jordans and keep your kid fly. Choose a godparent who gonna protect your child's life if you gone. Mm. 
Mm. What can they impart in your children? Mm. What do they have that you lack? Mm. I don't need nobody who's going to give them all the same stuff. I can give Come them. Come on. You still going to be their TT, but I need somebody who got something we don't have. Mm. Jeez. And I can be okay saying they got it and I don't, and therefore you don't have to go without mm. it. Mm. It makes me no less to steer them or direct them to somebody who has what they need rather than allowing them to walk through the darkness, bumping into stuff, and now I'm trying to figure out why they addicts. Because mm. you didn't equip them. Mm. Mm. You trying to figure out why they running with gangs because you working two jobs, and I get it. You trying to keep a roof over their head, but who else was around that you could have sat them with? Jeez. We are born with relatives. We choose family. Mm. That's good. Let that sink in for me. You, you are born with relatives. You choose your family. I am biologically the only child mm -hmm. and the only grandchild on my daddy's side. Yet I have an older sister in this room. I didn't even know I had until about six months ago. Mm. Mm. I chose her on purpose because I realized even at almost 38 years old, I can glean from her. Mm. Hey, Ruth, go find your Naomi. Everybody talking about looking for Boaz. Look for Naomi. <laughs> Find that woman who has been in the seat you sitting in and can tell you how to get Boaz. Mm. Ruth didn't do nothing but follow instructions. Mm. Esther mm. didn't do nothing but follow instructions. Part of our problem is we don't want nobody to tell us nothing. That's why we don't go to therapy because we think we know everything mm. and break everything we put our hands on. Mm. We have issues with authority because our mama talked to us wrong and our daddy hollered at us and all of this, but we didn't know that they got hollered at and that's the only way they know how to talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. that's you good. trying to figure out why every time the cable go off, this joker punch the wall. Mm. It, it's not about the cable going off, it's about him not knowing how to balance his finances because nobody told him mm. and nobody taught the people who were supposed to teach him. Mm. And mm. now you married trying to figure out why the lights keep getting cut off. Mm. Mm. We need to work backwards. Our problem is that we start here and we say we want to get to this goal and this is the plan I'm going to put in place to get from point A to point Z. Well, boo, you at point P and you ain't figured out how you got there. So my advice to you is to work backwards. Mm. You trying to figure out why the same things happen in every relationship you in, go back. Now, how, how, when you, you mentioned in every relationship that you're in, at what point do we get that it is our responsibility, although we didn't plant the seeds, but to uproot those things out of our life? And when do we get it that we can't continue blaming? Now. Mm. There's no cookie cutter answer for that. Yeah. Yeah. But the truth is, at a certain point in your life, you have to stop blaming it on everything else that's mm. happened. You have to do your work, work, even if nobody else does. Work. Because if you don't, you will bleed on the next generation that's connected to you. And you will pass that stuff down. Mm. And your kids will be in therapy talking about their mama, grandmama, and auntie who refused to go. Most of us who go to therapy go to therapy because somebody else didn't go. Mm. Hmm. I go to therapy to talk about the people in my family who won't go to therapy. Mm. Mm. Not for me to be validated in what I think or what I say, but in order to be taught that this is dysfunctional and this is how you don't recreate it. Mm. 
we learn how to function in dysfunction and we don't realize that it's dysfunction until we see somebody functioning appropriately. Mm. So what, what is the, it may be a crazy question, but what is the purpose, I know it's no cookie cutter answer, of therapy? What should I be going to therapy to accomplish? It depends on the individual. Maybe you're going to therapy because you're angry and you can't figure out why everything makes you angry. Mm -hmm. Maybe you go to therapy because you are grieving a transition. And when the cakes and the plates stopped coming, so did the people, but the pain didn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to therapy because eventually you want to be somebody's husband or wife and you know you ain't equipped to do that. Or you want to be a better parent. Mm. Or you just are not okay. Mm. Or you ain't got no reason at all, but you want a place that's safe for you to lay your stuff. Mm. Now, what if I know someone that needs therapy because I can see, sometimes we don't see our stuff, but other people on the outside can see our stuff. What are some ways that I, we talked about this a little bit in the back. Mm -hmm. How can I get them to know that they need therapy or what can I do to help them? The greatest gift that you can give anybody is exposure. And so invite them into settings like this mm. that don't feel like they're personal attacks on individual experiences, but yet something in the room can be said where they can go, ooh, yeah, yeah that might, she might be on my street. If not, she around the corner. Mm -hmm. Invite them into spaces that are safe. Walk in your transparency. If you ain't getting help for your stuff, don't invite nobody else to give help for theirs. Because mm. my response to you is going to be defensive. Mm. How dare you tell me how to raise my kids? You ain't even got yours. Mm. So again, we need to be careful. Mm. Shining lights on other people's deficits. Mm. When we got a whole bag full of stuff. Just because it's a Fendi bag don't make it any less heavy, baby. Mm. You still got a whole bunch of stuff in your baggage. You just package it cute. Mm. And <laughs> so we have to create spaces like this where we can see other people who say, I've been there. I'm still there. Mm. You are not broken. It was a mistake. You are not the mistake. Mm. We have to normalize mental health instead of stigmatizing mental illness. Mm. That's good. That's good. Mm. If I knew you had cancer, I would be foolish to say, oh, girl, don't treat that. We just gonna pray that thing up out. You ain't gonna have, you gonna go back and you gonna be clear. Now listen, I am a believer and I know that God can, That's he right. has, and he will. I also know that the same way that he equips and anoints oncologists, he equips and anoints therapists. Mm. And he is equally as concerned about your mind and your heart as he is your kidneys. Yes. <laughs> mm. He don't pick and choose the parts of you that he wants to be healed. Why serve a God who only cares about certain pieces of you? Jeez. Jeez. Now, how do you find a good therapist? So okay, so that's like finding a good church. Mm. <laughs> right? And, 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 and because you find another one doesn't mean the one you didn't find was bad. No. Like you said, you visited here, yes. but ended up there. Correct. Like, this is a great place. Y'all yes. are in good hands. Yes. Okay. <laughs> This is a, a, a phenomenal place. And there are other phenomenal places too, right. right? You just gotta figure out where you fit. That's right. You have to figure out what works for you in that particular season of your life. Mm. The same thing happens with therapy. You got to test some of them things out before you just get in there and spill all your business. Mm. Ask your therapist, do you have a therapist? Why would I drop all my stuff on you? Where you drop your stuff at? Mm. Who takes care of you while you trying to take care of me? Mm. Ask them, are you a believer? 
Because if I come in here and tell you the Holy Spirit told me such and such, and you tell me that I'm a paranoid schizophrenic and I'm hearing voices, we got problems. Because that is what can happen. Find somebody who is sensitive to your experience, mm. and that may not happen on the first go round, and that's okay. Mm. That doesn't mean that you stop looking. Right. If you know you have the opportunity to get a Tesla, but you got to go through Chevy first, you better go through Chevy and get that Tesla. Mm. That's right. You may have to try a few out until you find a space where you feel safe. Mm. If you can't be safe in therapy, you can't be safe nowhere. Mm. That's good. Legally, I'm obligated to be your safe space. Mm. Unless you tell me you gonna hurt yourself or somebody else that I'm telling. Because <laughs> mm. <laughs> you're not gonna get me fired. But mm. if I can't be safe in the place where I know the tools for healing exist, I will never obtain them. That's good. That's good. And, and so how does, we talk a little bit too, how does um, purpose, your lane, social media, play in the dysfunction of our community? <laughs> how much time we got? Mm. So here's the thing, especially in the pandemic, people didn't have anything to do but sit and scroll. And what happened was we sat and we scrolled and we saw that she opened a new business and he got certified in this and they bought a house and this one got engaged and you sitting there trying to figure out what it is that you're not doing. Mm. And you will begin to feel that you are not enough because you are comparing your 24 hour 365 experience to a seven second scroll. Mm. And the truth of the matter is that social media is never going to tell you the whole story. Mm. People look real busy, ain't done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you got 32 new businesses, not a LLC nowhere. Mm. I got three new certificates and still getting a link card. Mm. All of that is cute. Mm. But if you are busy and not productive, you still ain't doing nothing. Mm. And if I am comparing what it is for me to work a full-time job and be a full-time parent and a full-time everything else to this seven-second certificate that you posted on social media, of course I feel incompetent. Mm. Of course I feel like I should be doing more. Mm. When in reality, I should be celebrated for doing what I could to get through in a situation that didn't nobody know how to deal with. That's right, that's right. Mm. Far too often we minimize the things that we should celebrate. Oh well, you know, I'm a mama, it's just what I'm supposed to do, but you also supposed to sleep. <laughs> Mm. Uh, well, he shouldn't get no kudos for showing up. That's his daddy. That's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, but it's a lot of daddies who don't. Let, let's, let's understand that there's a difference between co-parenting and being a single parent. That's a whole mm, nother platform. Whole nother platform. That's right. You're not a single mom. You're a co-parent. You only have your kid four days. He got them the other three. Y'all co-parents. You do this together. Mm. You are a single woman who has a child, not a single mother. Mm. Mm. But we get caught up in labels that get us attention rather than doing the work, which is that you're bitter that you're single. Mm. Oh, I said what I said, and I'll say it again. We have to do our work. The work. Let's talk about the work because I think we can have a therapist every week. We can have a prayer line every week. We have great teaching and great groceries at this church. But at some point, you got to be consistent about doing your work. Um, you, you just, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know, you talked about how the therapist, and I know even when we meet with people, they do most of the talking because you got to do your work. 
Why don't we want to do the work? We don't want to do any work. <laughs> Half of us don't want to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and they pay us. <laughs> we don't want to. <laughs> yeah. And so it is no different when it comes to our personal work because it's hard. Yeah. And it's exhausting. And it's revealing. Mm. And sometimes it's embarrassing. Mm. And sometimes it hurts. Mm. Yeah. And so it's easier for me to leave it in the box that I put it in and package so well that people don't even look at when they come past me mm. than it is for me to reveal it. Mm. And it doesn't stop once you open it. Mm. There is no end point to the work. Mm. When you get a therapist that you can trust, keep her. Keep him. Because mm. every day you're going to go through something. It doesn't always have to be some major, explosive, traumatic, right. pandemic, divorce, blah, blah, blah. Girl, this boss I got. Mm. You need a place for that. Mm. You need a place to say, I love this husband, but I don't like that joke all the time. Mm. These kids. Mm. Hello. <laughs> you need a consistent space mm. with a non-biased person. Yeah. That's it. You don't pay me to be on your side. That's right. You're not going to come in here and say, my mama did this, 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 and me go, girl, you right. Mm. She was so out of line. No, ma'am, Pam, not I. Mm. That non-biased person stands in the middle because the truth is that our perspective is our reality. Mm. And so your position, your experience, your trauma, your brokenness, your whatever comes only from the lens through which you see it. Mm. And so all of us in this room will leave the room and tell a different story, even though we were all in the same space at the same time, because it is from the perspective of which we saw it. Mm. And so sometimes as a therapist, it is my job to play devil's advocate. Mm. Well, my mama did blah, blah, blah. Did she? Or did you? She talked to me reckless the way you talking to me. Mm. 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 Did she talk to you reckless or did she respond recklessly to what you asked her. Mm. Mm. That's good. My grandmother taught me from a little itty bitty before I knew I was a therapist. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm. And so we need places and spaces where sometimes my response to you as a therapist is nothing. Because mm. you don't always need an answer. Mm. Sometimes we just need somebody to listen. Sometimes we just need to be seen. We need to be validated. Mm. We need self-care. If it's the only 50 minutes a week you have by yourself, I used to do therapy in detention centers. Mm -hmm. And I would come in and they were like, oh, we don't have a group? Yeah. It's for y'all? Yeah. What are we gonna do? We gonna play spades. Mm. Miranda, that's not therapy. Lies you tell. These are three little black boys. I bet you they know how to play spades. I bet you the one who don't know how to play is gonna get cussed out. I'm gonna find out exactly what happens when he gets angry, mm. what happens when he don't know something and how he shows up. Don't tell me what isn't therapeutic. Because I understand who they are and where they come from. Therefore, I can make any experience therapeutic if I choose to see it that way. Mm. So what situations are you in in life every day that tell you the backstory of somebody that you don't know? Because yeah. our stuff shows up everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. That woman in Target and you trying to figure out why she just letting these kids holler. Because it's the only time she's been out of the house. Give her a little grace. I think it's so important that <laughs> we understand that last phrase. I'm, I'm learning that more and more every day of how to be more considerate to people, have an intelligent approach to people, 
apply grace to people. Um, you remind me of the story of, you can come, Chris, of this story of a guy who was on the train, on the L train, and he had four kids and they were just running rampant around this train. And um, the people were upset and they were confused and they were like, why won't we get these kids and sit them down? And, and, and they were yelling at the man and nobody even understood that he had just left the hospital from viewing his wife's body. And sometimes if we just back off for a minute and have an intelligent approach to people because you have no idea what anybody you walk up on is dealing with, has dealt you don't know what it took for people to get here this morning. That's right. You don't know. You don't know what people are leaving here to go back to. And for some people, like you said, this could be their only 90 minutes this week of just peace and the air is on and I'm not being bothered. And you gotta, you gotta know how to approach people like that. That's why we teach here, you gotta be flexible and rigid and know when to be both. Sometimes people wanna come, they wanna sit way in the back and they don't wanna be touched. Well, we hug here. You can't make nobody give you a hug. Because today they just want to chill. And maybe they don't want to be hugged because that's a trigger. Yeah. You can't just walk up and put your hands on everybody. Yeah. You don't know what used to happen when people used to just walk right. up and put their right. hands on me. We don't know enough about the hearts of people. Mm. And that's where the Holy Ghost comes in because there's other times people say, I just needed that hug. Correct. You know, somebody else says, I don't want nobody to touch me. And if we're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, That's right. we're in our own thing, trying to get our own thing accomplished. And I just encourage people, and I want you to share closing remarks, to have an intelligent approach to people, a compassionate approach, a considerate approach. Consider what they may be experiencing and let, let the Holy Ghost lead your actions and what you do. There is so much we can talk about here and we're going to have you back because I want to get down into some things. Somebody said this series has been going on too long. I, I, I feel like if we can have a, a thresh and flow series for three years and you know a prophetic conference for three months, we can talk about family as long as we need to talk about it. I'm, I'm not interested in just doing church and checking the card. We want to make sure this community is winning. And when we get ourselves together as a family, Man. then we can ex experience truly Man. all that other stuff. There's so much I'm learning about myself from therapy and talking to people. It's just that we just, some things we just didn't know. Some, it's not a bad thing, but some, we just didn't know. But when you know better. You do better. And so one of our next sessions is gonna be all things children and teens. How many of y'all got children in the room? Oh yeah, you should be here for that. We're gonna get down to it. But I want you to share closing remarks to these precious people regarding just kind of summing up, if you can, what we've talked about today. And ha have you been blessed by her sharing? <laughs> Go ahead, sister. If you hear nothing else of anything that I've said, hear this. You are worth the work. Mm. It's so easy for us to identify who we could pour into and how we could show up for this person better and who we could forgive and how we should love. But my challenge to you is to reverse that thing and give it to you. Look at yourself and know that you too are worthy of forgiveness and that you deserve to be loved Mm. in a way that isn't hurtful, mm. that you don't have to go through trauma to have love or to experience love or relationships. 
and that although the process may be long, you are worth the long process. That's right. That you don't have to give people a fast pass. Mm. That as long as it takes, be unapologetic about it. It's not gonna be easy, but it will be worth it. That's right. It's worth it for you. It's worth it for the people that are connected to you. Mm. You are worth the work. Going to therapy doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It means that you are just trying to become more right. It's good. It's a process. Can you pray for us, please? I can. Heavenly Father, God, I, I honor you and I bless you for these people who you specifically hand chose for this message. God, I, I bless you for, for those who came in with their stuff and their walls built high, hiding behind the masks that cause a certain level of protection that they've grown accustomed to. God, I bless you that you allow this to be a space where people begin to feel safe enough to take off the emotional mask that they have grown to put on. God, I pray that you would shift the hearts of your sons and daughters for you know each and every experience that each and every person has had. God, you were with her when she was abused and you were with him when he was abandoned. You were with them through the addiction and you were still with them in the recovery. God, I bless mm. you that you are a God in darkness and the same God when the sun rises again. I thank you, God, that you equip and e anoint for every single need that we have. God, I pray that today would be the beginning of a new season where caterpillars would begin to emerge from the chrysalis and bust out like butterflies. That people would begin to understand that it is in that moment of darkness where the caterpillar thought the world was ending when they broke out into that thing and was able to fly into freedom. God, I declare a freedom anointing over this place. God, I pray that you would meet every broken little girl who is packaged as a grown woman on today. Mm. That you would go back to every little boy who still couldn't figure out why his daddy didn't come back and meet him as the grown man that he is today. For that mother and father struggling in parenthood, for that husband and wife who was considering throwing this whole thing out the window, show up in this place and be God. God, for there's nothing a license can give me that you can't give them. And so I trust you to do what they need. God, everything for you have seen every tear that they've cried in the dark places that they thought nobody else knew about, oh God. Pour it back out into the seeds that they've sown and allow something beautiful to bloom. Give them beauty for their ashes, not because they're worthy or deserving, but because you are a God who doesn't lie and your word promised us that. God, I'm not asking you to do anything that you haven't already told us you were going to do. I'm just reminding you of what you promised. And I'm on this thing like Amazon Prime waiting to know when you're gonna show up. God, show up, not just in this place, but in our hearts. God, I send the angels of peace back into some of the homes that they're going to that are chaotic and declare and decree that the work will begin to be getting done. God, have your way in that place. God, stitch up the stuff that we've been putting band-aids on, acting like we're healed and still bleeding. Cover our children, God, and allow us to give ourselves the grace to know we're doing the best we can with what we have. But God, you can provide all. You can be in all places and do all things for all of us. 
And so I pray that you would dispatch the ministering angels that have been assigned to the lives of these, your children. God, that you would pull them up into your arms like the small babies they are in your sight and love on them and birth something new, a new life, a new healing, a new season, oh God, where we produce excellence and greatness in a way that we never even imagined or believed we could have. God, I trust you. Yes with their lives. And I thank you for equipping and anointing me to be present on this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let's honor the Lord for his presence here even now. Come on, come on. Come on, you can do better than that, come on. And let's honor God for the gift of God in Miranda. Come on, let's clap for her. Honor the Lord for her. Amen.